Next, we have Paul Conway from the American Association of Kidney Patients. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, give comment today. Um, as a kidney patient myself, I've managed kidney disease for 40 years, three years on dialysis, the past 23 years as a kidney transplant patient, and uh, I also have five heart stents. So many of the things that are in the report uh, resonate not just with me, but also in my role as Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients and as a board member of the Kidney Health Initiative. AAKP is the largest independent kidney patient organization in the United States. Right now in the United States, you have 37 million Americans that have kidney disease. And of those, half, more than half a million are on dialysis, 100,000 are waiting for kidney transplant, and you have tens of thousands who have kidney transplants like myself who are immunocompromised. Across that population, it's extremely diverse. And unfortunately, it's overrepresented in the minority communities among African American, Hispanic, Latino, Native American, Asian Island, Pacific, uh, they have a disproportionate uh, negative impact with kidney disease. And within those populations, also when you look at kidney disease, you have many cofactors, including heart disease, hypertension, anemia, many of the other cofactors that are listed. I was pleased to see in the 114 pages of the report, there are two references to kidney disease and they parallel exactly uh, the priorities listed by the CDC uh, for kidney patients being high risk. One of the things that I wanted to point out today are two very strong headwinds that I think that the Academy needs to be aware of for the kidney population. One is historic. And chiefly what that is, is there has been a um, tendency to ignore and not include kidney patients in clinical trials, uh, historically. Our organization, which has been in existence for 50 years, has worked quite closely uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and with researchers to change that. And more importantly, the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, which is a partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the FDA, uh, worked quite strongly since March and issued an actual policy statement in May calling upon uh, clinicians and researchers to include chronic kidney disease and kidney failure patients in clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines. I'm pleased to see that Moderna and also uh, Pfizer have included kidney patients in their trials. Right now, there are three phase three trials. Two of those do include uh, kidney patients. Kidney transplant patients are not included because of obvious concerns about immunocompromise and vaccine, but the Kidney Health Initiative is engaged with them in working with those communities and the transplant professionals, uh, and we will be doing that on an ongoing basis. The other headwind that I wanted to put on the table here that you need to be aware of is more modern. Uh, in fact, just in the past six months, in the past six months, the kidney population, and particularly kidney dialysis patients, have seen a tremendous number of news reports that indicate that kidney patients are not being included in emergency protocols in hospitals and in uh, many of the care delivery systems in the event of a surge or an overwhelming number. This is despite the fact that many kidney patients have advanced directives that say, keep me alive. This became such an issue in the spring that three major stakeholders, the American Association of Kidney Patients, the American Society of Nephrology, and the Renal Physicians uh, Association went to HHS and the HHS Office of Civil Rights. And the Office of Civil Rights issued very, very strong, unambiguous guidance to all healthcare providers in the United States that kidney patients on the American, under the Americans for Disabilities Act had the same protections and rights intact, regardless of the crisis. And the reason why I raise that is because the level of distrust that was raised by healthcare systems, not all of them, but some of them, and some healthcare providers is still echoing in the kidney community. Based on our survey data, which is rather robust, in March, 83% of kidney patients indicated they feared COVID-19 contracting it. By our tracking surveys in June, that number had gone above 95%. So while Patients are very aware of the fact that they're at risk. There's a high level of distrust also in terms of how they will actually be treated. And to echo some of the comments here, some of those are cultural and historic, going right back to Tuskegee, but also a lot of kidney patients understand that for the processes they go through, many of those drugs and procedures that they do did not involve patients at the start. So within the stakeholder community, we're trying to address that 
keep confidence, keep transparency, and educate people that a vaccine is coming. But when the guidance is issued, I would strongly encourage active engagement with the medical professional societies, the Kidney Health Initiative, our organization, and many other patient organizations to make certain that our capacities for communication are ready to go, but that you've done due diligence in making certain that it is 100% transparent, the prioritization of patients, because as a community, uh, historically, and especially among our minority populations within the kidney community, they felt as though their voice was not included in many of the medical solutions that they essentially have no choice in taking. Or Mr. In Conway, your, your time is up, if you can wrap up. Sure thing. So again, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, I've served under four presidents and three governors, including as the chief of staff for the U.S. Department of Labor. This is a health and workforce issue, and we appreciate the work that you do, and we stand ready to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for giving us some nuance uh, to the issues with kidney patients that we might not have known otherwise. So thank you very much.